as a bodybuilder, a health expert, a nutritionist, holistic, and as a, a bad ass chef. So, welcome to KQM Global and the Change Foundation. I'm your host, Jay Menez. And today's guest is an Army veteran, a White House chef, and he's frequently seen at major bodybuilding and fitness events all over the world. Please welcome my special guest, Chef Andre Rush. Pleasure to be here. Andre, <laughs> good to see you, man. Great to see you always. It's been a while. It has been a while. Yeah. Uh, so I heard the great news. You're about to release your first two books. I, I am. I am. So I'm excited about that. I get to tell a few secrets and uh, impact, motivate, and just be real as I possibly can be. Oh, you, you got me at secrets. Yeah. <laughs> you know Can you give us a little sneak preview uh, of that? Just, just hardcore. I mean, just things that happen in military, in the White House, and just in life in general. You know, as we all go through our changes, whether they're good or bad and different, we still make the best of them. Right, right. Well, and that's why we're here, the Change Foundation. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so that's a nice segue into my next question, which is, where do you feel you struggled most in your life, and how did you handle that change? I, where I struggled the most in life, uh, I grew up in a small town in Mississippi. So there was a lot of variables, you know, from, you know, racism to education to jobs. And uh, it just was stigmatized so much, right? So, you know, I, I had a big family, uh, five sisters, two brothers, and I always wanted to make my own way. So I didn't have like the guy, they were much, my brothers were much older than I were. My fa whole family was, except for my younger sister, who's a colonel. Um, and I didn't have that guidance. My dad worked 24 seven. My mom, she took care of all of us. So it was kind of left. I mean, they guided us completely well in doing everything. Uh, my, my dad got my work habits down packed. I mean, just I'm still the hardest worker today. My mother gave me my heart, which was the most loving woman ever. Uh, so I kind of combined them and kind of made the best out of it. But as far as the guidance wasn't always there because of the location I was. I tell people because of your demographics and where you are, it's always different. You know, from the South to the West Coast to East Coast, to, everything's different. Your lifestyle, the food, you know, the atmosphere, the culture. So uh, then when you kind of clash in the military, when I did, it was just a mixing pot of emotions. And so I was put into a leadership position very early uh, as a young kid and just thrown into that whole spot where luckily my work habits for my father and the diversity, um, I was able to conquer. Expand on that leadership position. Is that taking <coughs> care of your, your siblings? Uh, leadership in the military. Oh, got in, it. In the military. So in the military, you they have to put someone in charge. Mm -hmm. So basically, when I first got off the bus, I've never, in Mississippi, it was only black and white. There was no other colors. It was just black and white. And when I got off that bus out of MEPS, there was this rainbow of colors and emotions and different people, they were all male, of course. And so I first got off and it was hundreds of us and, and the drill sergeant came out and he said, he saw me. I mean, I was not as big as I am now, but I stood out and he came up to me and said, uh, Private Rush, can you whoop anybody out here? And I just said, yes, drill sergeant. And he said, you're in charge, take charge, and just left me there. And so it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because I was thrown into the mixing pot right away with the least experience with, you know, culture and, and all these diversities and everybody's fighting and doing all these things. So I had to figure out a way to bring everybody together. Kind of like the same thing I do right now. Yeah. Well, I want to hear what was going through your head at that moment when all of a sudden, and then he walks <laughs> off and everybody's looking at you. Like, what's going through your head? What's going through my head is, what did I get myself into, right? I, literally, it's like, what did I get myself into? Um, am I ready for this? I mean, I, un honestly, I had no fear at that age, and it was like even going to the White House. People ask me all the time, what was it like going to the White House? I had tunnel vision because the very first thing I did was look straight ahead. I didn't look left. I didn't look right. I went and said, what's my job, mm -hmm. right? So... At that point in time, even back then, it was, what's my job? What do I have to do to be successful? What do I have to do to, to lead this group, to make them like me, to, to bring us together? Um, and, but it was just, it was just a bunch of emotions. Yeah, wow. And so for somebody else 
uh, if you were to advise somebody that was in a similar situation, what would you, what, how would you advise them? In a similar situation as far as? Yeah, so you get thrown <coughs> into a, an unfamiliar situation like that. In your case, it's leadership. You know, you, you got all these people, the squad you have to lead all of a sudden. You've never done that before. Uh, and so I guess I'm talking about going into an unfamiliar situation and you have to perform. So, great question, by the way. So, me, it was like night and day because of the age, the time, demographically. Here, right now, if somebody's thrown in that situation, I mean, they have a, a million resources they can do. First off, knowledge is power. you going, learn your audience, learn, being very strategic in marketing. So, everything's a business. Life is a business. Relationships, marriage, uh, business. Everything's a business. You can't just go in blindsided and one-sided. You have to be very ambidextrous on both sides of the field. You got to learn your customers, same way they have to learn you. It just having to run it smoothly. So pick up your phone, research it, research the people, research the environment, research what you have to do to be successful at it. I mean, it's yeah. not hard, but people make it harder than what it really is. Like, what do I do? How can I do this? I'm going to fail. That's the first thing people say, I can't do this, when they say, let me conquer this. Yeah, for sure. It seems like there's a YouTube video for everything. There he is. <laughs> and uh, there are virtual mentors out there. So yeah. wherever you are geographically in the world, you can you can read about people, watch their videos. Uh, you know, a lot of people watch people like Tony Robbins or their favorite athlete who's, who speaks on sports or personal development. They just learn from them. And so mentorship doesn't, no longer has to be one-on-one. -on -one. There's virtual mentorship. Exactly. Where you might never meet, but you're heavily influenced by what they teach. It's true. It's right? True. Yeah. So how would you describe your mentorship roles these days? Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. Um, I, being who I am, I am probably the one in few. I actually answer all of my messages, thousands of messages. And people always say, Chef, you can't do that. I actually try to give it over to someone one point in time and they couldn't talk and act and mimic me because I do a lot of a lot of things. I have a huge audience, 85% of my audience is between 14 and 34, right? So I have a lot of kids. So a lot of military, a lot of um, uh, trafficking, abuse, uh, women, males also, uh, military, PTSD. So I've, I've answered hundreds of messages with suicide ideations, with depressions, with anxiety, with kids that needed mentorship, just questions. Just yesterday, a kid came on and said, I want to thank Chef Rush because he took the time and gave me some advice. And now I have my own. It was something simple. It was a food truck. And just from something I told him, it's like, don't you just not accept that? You know, you're your biggest worth, right? Or sometimes we devalue ourselves by mentality. People will try to devalue us as well, even myself, even now. You people try to devalue me, even me being who I am and where I am and how much I've worked so hard for it. It's people are going to be jealous and they're going to be uh, complacent or entitled with you. So you have to remember that. And I always take that with me at heart. So I take that 60 seconds or more out of my life to talk to someone. If I can reach them, great. If I lose one out of a million, I'm OK with that. So you're talking about uh, social media messages mostly? Uh, yes, so, social media, but I also go around, <laughs> speaking of that, I go around talking to about, uh, before COVID, even after COVID, I spoke to about 10,000 military members a, a, a year, right? So I go to all the military bases as requested, um, doing speakings. Uh, first thing I ask is speak to the spouses because they're the back balance of the military, along with the kids, their kids. People think it's the military members. No, it's the spouses. The spouses are the ones that are a support system for the military and for that. So I tell people, like, and re realistically, if I'm trained to do this in the military and go to war and the, the spouse, whether it be male or, or female, is not trained, imagine bringing that burden back to them, mm -hmm. right? Imagine what they go through with the kids and so forth. And then I have my own nonprofit, which is Tutu Inc., which is about kids and military with, you know, um, dispositions as far as mental health and PTSD. And also I do the uh, ambassador for Arnold Schwarzenegger after school all star kids. So I'm all about kids. So with this that we're talking here now, it's just perfect. This change is is just a lifestyle. I, I've done so many nonprofits from uh, 
uh, Headstrong to the Fisher House, uh, the Gold Star, which you're familiar with. I did Blue Star, Yellow Stars, uh, which is all about kids. Kids are the future and the foundation of this world. And we kind of take them for granted now. And we kind of just think that they're going to raise themselves because, like I said, it's a different age. So it's like, ah, you got all this stuff now. I didn't have that. So you're, you're okay. And that's not the question because that mental health part of it, where they can have something just catastrophic that happens in their life, like a hate crime or like, you know, someone unfortunately may be PTSD or maybe suicide. And you imagine that as a child and you having to go through that the rest of your life and you reflect on it, regardless of your age or who you are, everybody's going to go through something. So it is, it's, it's imperative that we pay attention to that. Right. And you were fortunate enough to have some great role models in your parents coming up. Did you have mentors outside of your family that you looked up to and were inspired by? So outside of my family, honestly, I didn't know what mentors were in Mississippi. I knew what great parents were, my mother and my father, to what they embedded in me. Uh, in the military, unfortunately, unfortunately, I met some great people, um, not so much mentors. Mm -hmm. People that I could have been a thousand times further than what I was because I was such a hard worker and because I did everything and I seemed to stand alone. And even with my awards, I have many, but I put I had a thousand more. But they were like, "You're okay. You, if I gave you an award every time you did something great, you'll have a thousand awards." But they'll take a thousand awards, mm -hmm. which, my, honestly, with me, that wasn't even a problem. But I remember and I reflected from that that I didn't have that support like I should have. I I made it. I did it. I conquered it. You look at me now and you think I was had the best life ever, which it was completely the opposite. So I took my reflections of my life and what I went through, trials and tribulations, and I give them to everybody. I tell people, they say, oh, I want to be like Chef Rush. And I say, no, be better than Chef Rush. You start where I left off. I'm giving you the blueprints. I'm giving you my book to everything I've done. So start right there. Don't, don't repeat mistakes I made because I told you to. But And sometimes people will do that. It doesn't make any sense. So when you talk about kids and young people who are very influential, and so that's why I'm so happy and, and fortunate that I have a younger crowd, that I can be a person who can kind of guide them. So I get a lot of parents that come to me and say, thank you, Chef, for being a great role model. Thank you for leading. Thank you for doing this. And honestly, to me, I say thank you back because they are my therapy. They are, that's my therapy, a way of me coping with the things that I have in life. So for all the good things you see, you don't see all the bad things. So it's a give and take. Yeah, well, you, you handle that well, obviously, which makes you such a great uh, coach or mentor, advisor, role model to, to the young kids. Thanks. Did you play sports growing up where you had a coach? I, I played sports. <laughs> I played a lot of sports. I actually was uh, a track and football. <clears throat> I played track. I played football. Um, I was an artist. I um, played basketball, of course. I had a track scholarship, uh, art scholarship. I was actually scheduled to go to the Olympics uh, for uh, the 110. Um, You're a sprinter. Or... I was a sprinter. Yeah. I was a sprinter. Uh, still am. But um, my work habits from my father, it was an old mentality of South, Southern mentality where the boys go to work, the girls go to school. So for a long time, it was go to work, go to work, go to work. So these scholarships didn't mean anything to me. The Olympics didn't mean anything to me. It was let me do my own way. My brother was already in the Navy. My other brother was a merchant marine. Uh, and I have a family of, of uh, educators and, you know, givers. So I went that route. People always ask me, do you look back? No, I don't look back. I don't say, well, if I had done, why would I say, I say, look what I'm going to do. <laughs> you know, I don't think about what I would have done because it's one of those things like, well, I should have done that. Sh it, you don't worry. You don't worry about the past. You, it's like you don't worry about bills. You worry about bills when they come to that point. Don't worry about a month ahead of time and be just worrying about it where you just bring that negative energy to everyone. So um, with me in sports, I, I, I still love sports. I mean, even that's why I incorporate the physical fitness, holistic eating and training and all those things with 
who I am now as a bodybuilder, a health expert, a nutritionist, holistic, and as a, a bad ass chef. So there you go. A <laughs> bad ass chef is right. <laughs> you mentioned the medals there. Can I, can I ask you about those? What are those for? <clears throat> so uh, this is a, a Legion of Merit. Legion of Merit is uh, usually given to high ranking officers. Uh, usually generals get a lot of Legion of Merit. Uh, this one is mine from stuff I've done in the military, which I was very humbled by. <clears throat> this is a bronze star. So I, um, I've i been in Iraq. I've been in Afghanistan a few times. I also got blown up in 9-11 when the plane hit in the Pentagon. Uh, so I was in that in that demographics, in that time. Wait, you got blown Were you in the Pentagon? I, I was. I was. Oh, wow. So the thing about people, and you say, talk about, perseverance and enduring and going forward. Uh, I've had both my biceps cut off, both my shoulders open. I've had my quadriceps blown up. I've had all these things happen. And when I had those things that happened to me, you know, and I tell this to the kids, right? Because they look at me and they go, oh my God, you know, you're like a, a superhero. You're like this and that, you know? And when I had my biceps cut off in the military, they said I would never grow again. I was smaller and, 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 and I could have just accepted that or I could do something to figure out how. And so I did how. I didn't overexert it. I was very smart and knowledgeable. Like I said earlier, it's like learning your body. No one knows your body better than you. You know when you got a cough, you're gonna cough. When you got a sneeze, you're gonna sneeze. So when you're hurt or when you're doing something, you, you know when to lay off and you know what to do. So through a bunch of, so my endurance training. So my endurance and my training led me to make my biceps grow, make my body grow, make my body become stronger and bigger and faster, and which I am to this very day. Mm, yeah, excellent, excellent. Well, I believe that we are all capable of achieving whatever we desire, as long as we're willing to put in the work. Of course. And have the drive, and no matter uh, where we're, our background, our level of education, age, whatever, you can achieve it if you want it. How would you expand on that? Because I know you agree with that. No, I 100% agree. I couldn't say any better myself. Uh, it, no limits. Um, we always limit ourselves. And like I said, again, a lot of things have to do with demographic where you're from. I mean, if, you're, if I was born here in LA, guess what? I get opportunities that come with LA. You know, you got movies, you got this, you got, uh, entertainment it's all over where it's accessible to you. So it's up to the people I'm around or to myself to make that happen. If I'm in New York, same principle. If I'm in Mississippi, I have a railroad. And it's like, okay, am I going to sit on this railroad and, and wait for a job for someone to pass away and, and ask for this job? Or am I going to go ahead and make something happen myself? And even when I do that is what's the future? What do you want out of it? Because I'll tell you, and I'll, I'll, I'm humble to say this, is that when I came into the military, I was held down a lot. I was held down a lot just because of my size. And some people, and you, people will find this out, and this I tell, tell the kids, that if you look to the left and look to the right, your best friend or that friend that you have may not be there forever because you may not align with them. They may want to keep you down because you're excelling and succeeding what they want to do because they don't want to be there. So it's okay to say, I'll see you later. I still love you, but I will talk to you later. So in the military, I found out a lot. So I worked in a lot of high profile physicians very early in, in life. I was thrown into, I was not supposed to be there. I'm telling you, I was a young black kid and uh, I was pretty, uh, I was pretty triggered. <laughs> so um, I was, uh, yeah, I was that person. But what's besides my size, what stood me apart was my work ethics. And what I used was I was, I call it, I was a, I was possum. You know possum? Mm -hmm. I yeah. played dead, right? Uh, I played dead. So people saw me, but everything I heard, 
I saw, I was chameleon, everything I heard, everything I saw, whether it be financial, whether it be leadership, whether it be, I took it from people. They took it, they didn't know that I was listening. They didn't know that I was observing. They didn't know that I was studying all the things they do, whether how they talk and how they react with people, what person is person. And even me, I had to change my voice, my tone. I was from Mississippi, I had a, a Southern accent, you know, and, and that was considered different, right? So I had to say, you know what, let me step this up a little bit. Let me change and bring it in. Just like when I talk to kids, when I talk to kids, I'm on their level. When I talk to corporate, I'm on this level. But I always have to be very ambidextrous. Some people, they just wanna be, this is who I am, I'm gonna give it to you whether you're a kid or whether you this. It doesn't work that way. You want everybody on your team, so you gotta do everything you need to do on your, for them to get on your team. But you, first of all, you gotta believe in yourself because you're your biggest worth and you can choose, and you can achieve anything. Yeah, well, that's great. And uh, so you're somewhat of a chameleon also then. I am. Yeah, in, in that, yeah, I, I get that. And uh, you do run across people that are like, yep, this is the way I deliver it, take it or leave it. And I guess that's a personal preference. It is, it's That's true. a style. Teach his own. I, I think that I agree more with you in that if you're really interested in educating, informing an audience, it's, it's up to you to deliver that in the way that they'll best understand. True. Right? Yeah, that's great. Uh, what kind of advice would you give to uh, uh, a young person who's dealing with racial injustice and discrimination? How, how would you tell them to handle that in, of course, a nonviolent way? <coughs> um, again, another great question. I mean, you're, you're talking to me, uh, it, I go back to my book where I said, I, you know, we have the incident with George Floyd and we had so many incidents. And uh, I just did a thing with NBC. It was a virtual, it was 300,000 people, but I talked to my military panel, which was um, all black. And I, I said to them on the panel that we're not going to disagree. That doesn't mean that we're not still friends or that we're not this and that, because I think of things different. I say that because I grew up in Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi was, is, was, and always will be number one on that spectrum. Uh, I had the, I used the word, the pleasure of understanding what it meant and why. Using those words because I was called them as a kid. I've heard my mother call them, my father called them, and they meant differently back then than they do now. Back then, it was, I don't even know how to explain it. It was emotional. It was driven. It wasn't how it is now because guess what? Everybody and their mother uses that word for every demographic and all the time, every time. So it's diluted and it's, you don't give a right to say that word and so forth. But at the same time, I tell kids is that the first thing that people will try to do is bring you into their circle because they need hate to fuel hate, right? It's, it's, I tell people it's, it's hard as hell to be positive. It's easy to be negative. It's easy to be angry. So you, you got to think about that person. Every person is an individual. If that person did it, I'll, I'll use it to cliche. If, if that cop did it, it's that cop. If that cop did it, it's that cop. I don't blame the rest of those cops because guess what? One point in time, you're still going to need them. Now, if they're all bad, they're all bad. But if, if 98% of them are good, they're all good. So you got to think about what you're going to do and what you're going to lead off, not only for you, but for your kids and for your friends and how you're going to be, because you're going to be, you're going to be that statistic, right? You have to think about actions and reaction, causes for it, but you also got to be the bigger person, the better person. I teach my own kids about that. And they're very, I mean, it's very hard conversation. And I have to explain this to them is how I was. And they're like, Dad, why, why are you not angry? I'm not supposed to be angry because a guy like me being angry as a big guy, I'm going to have a bunch of people that's going to feed off of my energy and they're going to get angry also. So I tell them if you're positive, when I say positive, doesn't mean you have to, you're not being upset, not being indifferent, not standing for what you believe in, but you have to be very smart because all that you bring with you, everybody's going to look at you and follow it with you forever. Whether it be on social media, whether you're trying to get a job or whether you're trying to get a scholarship and they look at you and see what you're doing, that's your life. Mm -hmm. And that's going to affect the rest of your life. And you, 
you really need to think about that. It's about being positive, um, which I try to be. And trust me, sometimes it's extremely hard, but at the same time, I know I have to be. If I want to do it, I need to make a change. I need to do something about it in a positive way. I need to be that change. I can't just type it to death. I can't be a keyboard warrior. I need to say, oh, you need to do this. No, you do something. I'm just one person. I'm one person also, right? I was one person a year ago. I was one person 10 years ago. I'm still that one person that's going to make a change and not hiding behind anything. Mm. Yeah, amen. I love that. Uh, what do you think the biggest challenge is? What are the biggest challenges we're facing today in creating positive, meaningful, permanent change? The biggest problem we're facing today? Well, what are the yeah? What is the what is the biggest <coughs> challenge that's preventing us from getting there? So I'm gonna be honest with you. One of the biggest problems that we have of us getting there is that we're entitled. We're very com we're very entitled. We're very complacent. We take everything for granted. Gratitude, there's none. Everything that we have, and even myself, you know, I can go in my refrigerator. It's a, it's a, it's a fridge full of food, and I'm not grateful about that because I see it there every day. I got money in the bank, and I just see it. And you think about the next person that does it, and so forth. So if you, you think about the things, and you have a little humility, and just think about your friends, the people that don't have these shoes. I wore the same shoes for three or four years at a time. I used to walk around barefoot just so, and the people thought I did it to run because I was a fast runner. I did it to preserve my shoes, right? And even to this very day, who I am, I would take a toothbrush and scrub the edges of my, of, of where I work. I, it, it doesn't matter, right? You have to always reflect and say it to yourself and look in the mirror and say that I'm someone, I need to make a change, I need to be positive. And when I say it, because people say, oh, positive, that's nothing, you know, I don't wanna be positive. What do you wanna be when you grow up, <laughs> right? Are you gonna be that same person looking in the mirror and say, I don't wanna be positive with no friends? And even if you have a lot of money and you still are worthless, mm. that's, that's a difference with that. So you gotta think about that. Yeah, so be more grateful, quit complaining and be, be the kind. change. Yeah, be the be change, the change be that you're looking for. You'll be you'll be surprised, especially in DC. No one smiles. And <laughs> Mississippi is called a hospitality state. You know, regardless if you're a mile away, you're gonna see somebody waving, and you're like, Are you you waving at me? In DC, no one speaks to you. And Arab people, they look like, oh, what are you looking at me for? What are you doing that? Everybody's always in a hurry and a rush, right? And everybody wants to run in front of you to get right in front of you to have an accident. Or you know, I call it unnecessary deaths, you know, unnecessary accident, unnecessary everything. When all you have to do is just, even myself, I have to think and just go, maybe they're in a hurry because something happened. Maybe they have this or maybe they have that. I have to keep saying in my mind just to keep myself on a calm level. Because like yourself, you know, traveling all the time, you're around a million different people with a million different attitudes. And a million, because it's easy. You can talk to a hundred people and they'll be happy. And then you talk to one person that has an attitude, and guess what? That one person can control you, and he takes it away from you for the whole entire, he or she takes it away from you for the whole entire day. Yeah, I've been there before. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think the difference there with you and me and, and maybe other people is that once you learn to recognize that, you, you can see it in yourself, and you can self-correct and make that shift very quickly. Whereas if you don't even realize that's what's going on with yourself, then you can stay in that funk forever. Self-awareness, yeah. Yeah, intestinal fortitude. Um, and you know, I have PTSD. I've had PTSD. I've been through a lot of different things. And um, I was in two inpatients for six months at a time, an outpatient for another year. Don't talk about it. Don't say about it because it's not who I am. But at the same time, when I was going through all my therapy and people talking to me, it didn't resonate with me. And... I had to come up with something, literally, because um, there's a bunch of medication. And it was just, it, it, I was always, like you just said, I was always, I always knew my body. My body always spoke to me. My body always spoke to me. When my body stopped talking to me, I knew something was wrong. I was not myself. You know, and one day I just threw everything on a bed and threw everything away, cold turkey, which was the worst thing in the world to do, but also the best thing in the world to do for me. Um, and, and, and then that's when 
you know, that self-awareness comes to you tenfold and you're just looking at epiphany of saying, okay, I know what I need to do now. What is one thing, tangible thing, that we can all do to uh, support this mission of change? <sighs> mission of change, um, you know, it, change someone, change someone, I, I, it's a, it's a, like a dumb, it's like the, um, what do they call it, where, um, not that like a butterfly effect, not even a domino effect, but it's just, the thing about change and what's so important about what you guys are doing is that a lot of people would never know or understand it because they always fight against it. They won't know what even change means because they've never had that opportunity to understand, right? So when you put yourself into someone else's shoes fully and completely, whether it be a child or adult or male or female, and understand that, or even if you had that changed already, and it could be from so many things from a, a life experience or near death or religious or however it is, and then all of a sudden you have that whole part of it, you should spread that to someone. You should, if one person, like, ah, if I get one person, one person can go into another, into another. You never know what a person's platform is. And you never know who a person is. I tell them just like I'm in, the, in when I'm in the White House. They asked me about feeding the president. And I said, I feed the president on this level. I feed the homeless on this level. Because the president gets it all the time. The homeless, they never get it. I may change their life. They may come out to do something different. Service is service. You never waver on service. Whether they are monetarily, you know, uh, looks, racial, religious, service is service. Treating people the way they should be treated and how they treat is a lifestyle that you should always be trying to spread around. So if you're going to change, you know, ch change someone for the better. Just put that positive, put that positive energy into the world and you'll be surprised. Even just sitting down beside you and seeing you smile, it makes me relax. It makes me comfortable. It makes me smile. <laughs> <laughs> Good vibes, right? Good vibes. You got to have them. <laughs> right on. Well, thank you very much for oh, you. Uh, coming in to talk to me and for supporting the Change Foundation, Thanks. especially. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to do this again. We will. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Chef. Thank you. Huge thanks to my special guest, Chef Andre Rush. Be sure to connect with him at Real Chef Rush on social media. Thanks for watching. I'm Jay Menez, and we'll see you on the next episode here at KQM Global and the Change Foundation. Chef, thank you. Thank you.